the call to order the Green Mountain Care Board's hearing of September 6, 2023. We have uh, a number of agenda items. Uh, first, we're going to review the standard budget order conditions, and there's a potential vote noticed. After that, we're going to have deliberations and potential votes on um, a number of hospitals. I'm not sure if we'll get to all of them today. I think we'll go in the order that's presented on the agenda. So Southwestern, Northwestern, Brattleboro, Manuscutney, North Country, Grace, Cottage, and Springfield. I'm not overly confident we'll get to the last few um, or that we'll get all the votes done, but we'll at least start the process today. And they'll be led by uh, Director Limberg and Mr. McCracken. Uh, so I'll turn it over um, to uh, Ms. Uh, Director Limberg and Mr. McCracken for the budget order conditions. Thank you. Uh, so just a quick overview. Uh, we will review the standard hospital budget conditions, uh, review some of the statutory factors that are part of the hospital budget review. Um, that third item we're actually going to postpone uh, till next week, uh, but we'll talk about some of the inflationary indicators that we're looking at. Um, and then we will uh, see how many of these hospitals we'll have a chance to uh, deliberate on today. So with that, I will turn it over to Mr. McCracken. Um, great. Thank you, Sarah and uh, board members. So. <clears throat> We're coming back to the what we're calling the standard budget conditions um, that we reviewed uh, at our last meeting and we had some input on and have made some changes. Um, I wanted to start with just a, a, to note again what I um, said when I presented these last week that these are um, effectively default conditions. Um, that would form the baseline of the conditions that the board would attach to uh, hospital budgets. Um, so the, for each budget approval, the board would include in its motion um, to include the standard budget conditions or any additions or changes to it. So the board could certainly add or modify any of these conditions for a particular hospital. Um, if the board decides that it would be appropriate based on the specifics of that hospital situation and budget submission um, to do so. So with that note up front, um, the changes from what were reviewed last week, and I'm only going to highlight the, the changes here since I walked through all the conditions last week or, um, at our last meeting. So um, the changes are highlighted. The first one is in uh, condition D. Uh, which is that the hospital's expected commercial NPR based on its budget submission as adjusted by this order is a dollar amount that GMCB can determine based on the budget submission. Um, the hospital would then report its actual expected commercial NPR not later than uh, we had previously said February 15th, but there were some comments that that didn't provide sufficient time uh, to see uh, like a full um, month or enough time for the hospital to actually calculate its NPR, uh, commercial NPR. So we moved that back to March 15th, recognizing that not all hospitals are the same. Uh, I also suggested uh, some flexibility here that the chair could specify a later date if that were necessary, given a hospital's um, um, contracting cycle with, uh, with their commercial insurers or any other factors. Uh, so that was the first recommended uh, that was the first change from what was covered last week. Um, uh, next slide, if you want, know, Sarah. Uh, I had no suggested changes on this set of conditions. These are um, generally reporting conditions for the hospitals um, and fairly consistent with prior years. Uh, next slide, Sarah. Uh, this is a, an additional condition that was um, raised by uh, board member Holmes, and hopefully I've uh, captured it here in a kind of appropriate way. 
So it's to say the hospital shall develop a system to be able to measure and report to the board the referral lag and the visit lag for each hospital owned primary uh, and specialty care practices, as well as the top five most frequent imaging procedures. Um, and then referral lag and visit lag are defined here in the same way that they're defined in the board's FY24 guidance. Um, the reporting to for primary care and specialty care practices and top five most frequent imaging procedures is also the metric that was you or the practices that were identified in the FY24 guidance. So really we're capturing that same wait times reporting requirement. And so the condition is for hospitals to have a system to be able to report those metrics. And then uh, for and then um, in the bullet down below, you'll see the hospitals would be required to report referral lag and visit lag uh, for those practices and procedures once mid-year on April 30th, 2024, um, covering the periods of February and March 2024. And then, as the board might require in the FY25 hospital budget guidance. So, in other words, what would be required to be submitted with the hospital budget uh, submission next July for FY25. Uh, so, next slide, Sarah. <clears throat> and I didn't have any proposed changes in these final uh, set of conditions. Um, uh, they're, again, they're consistent with what we've had in prior years. Um, and I didn't have any changes to those coming out of the last meeting. Um, so with that brief recap and uh, summary of the changes, I will um, turn it back to you, Mr. Chair, for board um, discussion, suggestions, changes, and um, there is some potential motion language here uh, if the board uh, decides it's ready to vote. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, I had one late uh, addition that I wanted to make to the standard conditions which relates to the population health management um, dollars earned by hospital owned primary care. And the goal is to ensure that those dollars are being utilized for primary care. Um, and I think the language, and we can discuss it if board members would like, um, but something along the lines of uh, uh, hospitals must account for and report back to the Green Mountain Care Board in their annual budgets the amount of population health management dollars uh, earned by uh, hospital on primary care, specify how those funds were used to support primary care, and describe the impact those funds had on improving primary care. Could you just reread that one more time? Um, yeah, I think the, the proposal I had in, in tried emailing it to Russ just a moment ago, but it would be hospitals must uh, in their annual budget account for and report back to the Green Mountain Care Board the amount of population health management dollars earned by hospital owned primary care, specify how those funds were used to support primary care, and describe the impact those funds had on improving primary care. Could I ask you a couple questions? Please. Um, are are you do you mean to include the ACO? So there, what I'm trying to sort out is what we mean by pop or what you mean by population health management funds. So that could be inclusive of the blueprint for health PMPMs that go to primary care the ACO dollars that go to primary care, 
And if Blue Cross uh, creates a primary care program, their dollars, are you inclusive of all of those dollars? Were you looking to be more specific to just the ACO dollars? Yeah, good question. Um, I meant to be specific to the ACO dollars, given some of the concerns and lack of clarity um, that came out in our prior hearing about whether or not those dollars had been um, focused to primary care. Uh, I don't have the same concern as to the blueprint dollars or any future um, insurer dollars because they haven't happened yet, um, but I would be open-minded to doing that in the future if we needed to. Okay, so my suggestion would be it should be clear that we are specifically talking about population health management dollars received from One Care Vermont, um, unless you also want to include the uh, Medicare only ACOs in this as well. Do you have thoughts either way on that? Um, I guess I would err on the side of including those ACOs um, since they are fairly new to Vermont and, um, you know, they don't have a big footprint, but it's my understanding we're going to have several of them uh, coming in with budgets this fall. So I think just so that we're keeping all the ACOs in the state on a level playing field, it would make sense to understand um, Stand, understand that broadly. A hospital wouldn't necessarily, you know, they won't be receiving it from more than one ACO potentially unless they're participating in a Medicare only and then one care for the other programs. Or not one care and one of the others as a possibility. Right, right. So, yeah. right. No, I think that makes good sense. I think that makes good sense. We could change it to um, popula population health management dollars received from an, an ACO earned by hospital-owned primary care. Would that address it? Yep. Yes, I think so. Yep. Okay. And uh, Robin, did you have more questions? I don't I don't mean to interrupt, but no, you go ahead. Thank you. Uh, along the same lines of inclusivity, um, would it be possible for a hospital to receive population health management funds and use them in an appropriate way, but not to primary care. So I understand the concern that the specific concern, Owen, that you raise um, with primary care funds that came out in a prior hearing. Um, but do we want to be keeping track of how the population health management dollars are distributed um, overall? Perhaps somebody's distributing them in some other way, and that works great, or it fails miserably, and we'd like it to be more focused on primary care. Should we allow people to describe, allow hospitals to describe what they're doing, um, even if it's outside of primary care? I guess that's my question. I. I, I think I'd want to speak with the ACO team and the policy team a little bit more to understand if that's best in the ACO process or if it's something to be done in the hospital process and how that relates and if we're getting sufficient information on the ACO side. Um, I, I, I tailored this proposal and I apologize for doing it so late, um, but I tailored it to the specific issue that had arisen um, when we were doing the ACO review earlier this spring. So I don't know that I wouldn't be open minded to that kind of suggestion, but I wanted to keep this pretty, pretty tailored. Mm -hmm. um, just a logistical note is um, the way that some of these funds, as I understand it, are transferred may not make it easy to isolate um, some of what I think you're trying to get at. Um, part of that is by design for an all payer uh, program. So I think. Um, yeah, I, I think this could use some more workshopping and uh, 
just figuring out if it makes sense as a, a standard uh, budget condition or if there maybe is a uh, other avenues to make sure that we're getting uh, the information uh, in a way that is meaningful. Yeah, so I, I, I want to take away the opacity and ensure the money's going there. So if it's not easy to isolate, I want to see if there's a way that we can I think to be clear, be I, yeah, I, I don't want to be misunderstood. I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, like the population health payments from the what we think of as blueprint are lumped in with other things. And um, yeah. so, uh, yeah, so like the exact uh, payment that you are, I think, trying to isolate may not currently be flowing. So we just have to be mindful of what that would mean in terms of uh, lead time and burden and, and uh, you know, the juice squeeze ratio. I, th I think to Tom's point, um, there could be dollars that are earned by the primary care that flow to, for example, a nutritionist who supports the primary care, but is not necessarily in the primary care budget. So I, which I think, Owen, oh, to your point, would still support the primary care, but may not be quite as one-to-one -one as Uh, the language suggests. And I think you would want to capture that, right? So you'd want to make sure that we were capturing uses that support primary care, even if that is not located in the primary care office. Yeah, I think that's right. I, and the <clears throat> intent of the latter clauses about specifying and then describing the impact is to get at that. And if the money is being intentionally allocated to support a nutritionist because it's beneficial to the primary care goals and effort, good let's understand that and then second let's think about whether or not that is having the impact that we want so i just want it to be intentional if the money yeah. is going to support additional supplies at the hospital you know that might be more loosely uh connected to primary care and so that's the intent of the latter clauses is to be intentional about where those primary care dollars are are going and if they're supporting the reform policy effort that we have behind this I think the other sort of wrinkle we need to think through is not all hospitals own primary care, so it really should not be a standard condition. It should be only for those hospitals who own primary care. Or I guess we could, you know, make some additional edits to make it clear that if, you know, if it, if it's appropriate, meaning they don't have primary care affiliated with their hospital, like for example, yeah. Rutland does not. Right. The, the language in, that it would be to describe population health management earned by hospital and primary care. So if you didn't have it, this condition wouldn't be triggered. Got it. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Sorry. It's. It, I like to see things in writing. <laughs> it's hard for me to process it verbally. Yeah, no, same. Yeah. <laughs> and how would that apply to like Gifford, which the hospital is owned by the FQHC, right? So it's not hospital owned primary care, but it's hospital affiliated primary care. Um, I, I don't know the dynamics of that sp specific situation and how the money would be earned and flow okay. with an F hospital owned by an FQHC. Yeah, I guess <clears throat> I go. Uh, um, guess a, a general question: Hospital could a hospital earn? population health management dollars without having primary care affiliated there. And if they could, wouldn't we want to understand also how they're using those dollars? Because I, we may learn something interesting about how they're using that money that could inform other places. So I understand the desire to have a, a for this to be tight based on our history. Um, but I'm just thinking, 
what do we really want to understand? And from my point of view, it's our population health dollars being used in a way that improves population health. And that may or may not be primary care. We had an instance in a prior meeting where we're not sure that primary care funds got to primary care. But if population health funds can be earned and spent and improvement results, I'd like to I'd like to know about that. So a description of how the money, how they earned it, how much it is, where it gets distributed. I'm I'm interested in removing and making that clear. Yeah, I think to me this just feels like um, you know, as was on the docket is as we reevaluate the data model for how we're kind of collecting information from hospitals and tracking this funds flow. Um, it is complicated. It's uh, will take some time to unpack, but I think, yeah, I, I just have some concerns about um, you know just adding it without some more diligence. Um, so I would maybe recommend we put a pin in this for now and offer um, a chance for the hospital finance team to consult with the ACO team and figure out um, what makes sense and uh, come up with a proposal that we can provide in writing to take up next week. <clears throat> I think that makes good sense. Uh, but before I do that, are there any other, so I hear like trying to make sure that the dollar, understanding the funds flow, making sure that uh, the return on that investment uh, is uh, operating the way we would expect or, or in a way that we can measure more uh, directly. Any other board member uh, thoughts about what we're trying to measure or get at with uh, such a condition? Okay. Um, so uh, we'll, uh, I think that means probably not worth a vote today uh, and likely it won't be ready to vote on this on Friday, but uh, hopefully Monday we can take this back up. All right, you, that could work for you, Russ. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's fine. Um, <clears throat> I think that's fine. Before we move on though, I would just, uh, open it up to any other board member uh, comments, questions, concerns, or additions that we should um, work to incorporate as well. I didn't have any others, <clears throat> um, although, you know, just for a preview, I, I would support all of the conditions we have in here, and as written, I would support it. And if there's a way to incorporate the suggested change that I had made today, <clears throat> I'd be supportive of looking at it and seeing if we can do it. But otherwise, I, I would approve all of these. Yep. Yeah, I haven't said very much, but I would approve all of these as well as written. And I support the spirit of what Chair Foster is trying to achieve with the accountability on the funds flow. So look forward to kind of seeing what that language shakes out like, but support the spirit of it to be sure. I do as well. I just would comment quickly with regards to the amendment that Chair Foster suggested. I think that we talked about maybe maybe two subtle differences, um, and I and I support both initiatives. I, I don't know if they're both appropriate for the hospital budget conditions, but one is an accounting of the dollars that were intended to go to primary care. Another one is I think getting to what Member Wall suggested, which is thinking about um, how population health dollars are being used, coming up with a broader understanding of this and trying to reflect on what's working and, and how we can um, help use our position uh, to help share the, the successes that people are having and maybe uh, areas where they're not successful in use of this money. So that, that I almost feel like there's kind of almost two aims of that have been brought up here. Um, and so I just think we need to think through if both of those are, are appropriate or maybe I misunderstood 
what member Walsh was suggesting, but I, I think it's actually a really um, potentially uh, significantly beneficial um, uh, understanding that we could have and share. You, you didn't misunderstand and you said it better, so thanks. All right, I think with that we can probably pivot to the next agenda item. We can we can move on. I when this comes back before um, I'll also make clear in the motion language here that this applies to as the standard budget conditions apply to um, any hospital budgets that were approved with the standard budget conditions before we made this vote. So just so that it all uh, holds together correctly. But I just wanted to note that um, <clears throat> before we look at hospitals later. Yep. OK, you ready for the next right. slide? <laughs> uh, I am. Thank, thank you, Sarah. <clears throat> uh, so I'm going to take a couple of minutes here and look at the Boards, um, uh, criteria and principles for hospital budget review as set out in statute. And I know that you're all have seen these before and you're familiar with them. So uh, I'm just, this is a review. But you know, as we know, the board has a statute, uh, has some statutory duties to review and establish hospital budgets consistent with um, the board's uh, um, overriding uh, obligations and health care reform principles. There's a hospital budget rule that gives us a more specific process. And then there's, of course, the FY24 guidance adopted under that rule. And all three of these are relevant and applicable for the board's hospital budget review and deliberation. Um, this today is a look specifically at the hospital budget um, statutory factors. And starting here, just as a kind of a refresh, these are what the board said in the FY24 guidance uh, around the um, statutory factors. Uh, I'm not going to reread it because it was in our guidance and it's a long thing and I'm going to go through the statutes in the next slides. So um, we can go ahead to the next slide, Sarah. <clears throat> Under the board's hospital budget review statute in 9456, um, it instructs the, the board on what to review and what to consider in establishing the hospital budgets. Uh, that includes things like public comment, where it says that the board shall solicit public comment on all aspects of hospital costs and use and on individual hospital, uh, individual budgets submitted by the hospitals. There are a number of other factors set out in the statute that the board goes through process wise. Then the statute says that hospital budgets established under the section meet these six criteria, which are be consistent with HRAP, take into account national, regional, or in-state peer group norms according to indicators, ratios, and statistics established by the board, uh, which we have set out in our guidance, um, promote efficient and economic operation of the hospital, reflect the budget performance of prior years, um, include a finding that the analysis provided in a prior section, which is related to um, how this statute reflects uh, a um, shift from um, shift between uh, commercial and uh, public payers uh, and demonstrate that they support equal access to appropriate mental health care needs that meet standards of quality access and affordability equivalent to other components as part of an integrated holistic system of care. Then we move from, uh, next slide, Sarah. Moving from the hospital budget statute, we have 
the board's uh, sort of broad authority statute that says the board shall execute its duties consistent with the principles expressed in section 9371. Those duties include reviewing and establishing hospital budgets. Uh, next slide, Sarah. Uh, these are the healthcare, uh, the principles for healthcare in Vermont set out in 9371. Um, I'll highlight a couple, but not to the exclusion of any others. So you see the first three here, um, that the state must ensure universal access and coverage for high quality medically necessary health services in Vermont. Systemic barriers uh, such as costs must not prevent people from accessing necessary health care, and Vermonters must receive affordable and appropriate care at the appropriate time in the appropriate setting. Uh, overall health care costs must be contained and growth in health care spending in Vermont must balance the health needs of the population with the ability to pay for such care. And the health care system must be transparent in design, efficient in operation, accountable to the people it serves. And the state must ensure that public participation in the design, implementation, evaluation, and accountability mechanisms of the health care system. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, we have here the importance of primary care and the importance of appropriate mental health care. Um, I actually just included all of the factors in these slides, but um, like I said, I'm going to highlight just a couple. Uh, so, Sarah, we can go on to the next one. Um, so among the factors we have that Vermont's healthcare system must include mechanisms for containing all system costs and eliminating unnecessary expenditures, including by reducing administrative costs. And by reducing costs that do not contribute to efficient, high quality health services or improve health outcomes. Uh, efforts to reduce overall healthcare costs should identify sources of excess cost growth. Uh, we can go to the next slide, Sarah. And then we have <clears throat> An important principle that Vermont's healthcare system must operate as a partnership between consumers, employers, healthcare professionals, hospitals, and the state and federal government. And the state government must ensure that the healthcare system satisfies the principles expressed in this section. In addition, and we go on to the next slide. In addition to the principles of healthcare in 9371, <clears throat> we have here the principles of the Green Mountain Care Board. Uh, set out in section 9372, improving the health of the population, reducing the per capita rate of growth and expenditures for health services in Vermont across all payers, while ensuring that access to care and quality of care are not compromised, enhancing the patient and health care professional experience of care, recruiting and re retaining high quality health care professionals, and achieving administrative simplification uh, in health care financing and delivery. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to provide this as the kind of statutory bedrock on which the board's hospital budgets review and decisions um, are based. And um, I'm happy to take questions, um, although I would say if you're going, if there are questions that um, solicit legal advice of counsel, the board may consider whether those questions are appropriate for an executive session. I don't have any questions, but I really appreciate you providing that framework to remind us of the factors we should be considering. And um, I found that really valuable, so thank you. I, I too don't have questions at this time, but I could see having questions um, at, at some point through this process uh, on a specific hospital with a specific factor in here that I I, I could see wanting uh, advice on. So it, would that be an opportunity as time goes on? Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. If, as you know, this is a general non-hospital specific run through of the statute. If there are specific questions that come up, um, we can address them if they are questions that call for advice of counsel that can be appropriate in uh, an executive session to 
if um, um, and that's a determination the board could make at the time the question uh, arises. All right, uh, anything else or are we good to move on? OK, all right, wonderful. Thank you very much uh, for that. Background, um, so just a quick. Oh, I wouldn't I wouldn't say quick, uh, just as we think about um, inflation, which I don't know if you've heard has been uh, uncharacteristically high in recent years. Um, we're trying to, uh, you know, there's different ways to think about in inflation, how it affects the consumer, how it affects the prices uh, that our ho that hospitals and other providers are forced to pay. And so um, just wanted to provide some grounding in some of the um, metrics that are available um, to project. So those that we have on a go forward basis versus those that we kind of have a historical uh, perspective on. So um, one uh, indicator that is used by our partners in Maryland to kind of think about um, their global budgeting process and the prices that uh, that uh, providers face um, and is factored in to local conditions is what we call the Medicare market basket. Um, it has several different iterations. Um, but here we're looking at just the inpatient hospital portion. So the projected growth from fiscal year 22 to 24 for that measure is 7%. Um, so again, that is really the, the cost basis as Medicare tries to look at it. And if you just look at how much of that they're projecting from 23 to 24, it's 3.1%. So um, a little bit more heavily loaded from 22 to 23 than from 23 to 24. But these values are still... Um, a bit higher than historical uh, values. And if we look at uh, median income, we were able to um, leverage some projections there. So the projected growth in uh, Vermont's median household income is 8.6% um, for fiscal year 22 to 24, um, with that growth looking at 3.9% from fiscal year 23 to 24. Um, the indicator we used in the guidance this year was related to um, the producer um, uh, producer provider produce, producer provider index the PPI, um, which had to do with general medical and surgical hospitals. And when you look at kind of the longitudinal trend of two-year growth rates, um, the median um, in the that series was 5.8 percent growth over a two-year period, but quite a wide confidence interval of 1.1 to 10.5 percent. So a lot of um, kind of noise in that data. Um, when you think of uh, consumer inflation, the CPI, Consumer Price Index, uh, if you recall or have a chance to review the work done by the um, Covet and Carr last year, um, the medical inflation tends to lag uh, CPI, and that has to do with um, how sticky prices can be. So you negotiate the prices one time for the year and then come back to it. And so if you kind of shift the distribution, you'll see uh, the the trends are more aligned. So just some things to think about as we think about inflationary growth and, and how to grapple with that really difficult question um, in our proceedings. Um, so next I'd like to just turn to um, uh, the hospital budget decision tree. So in consultation uh, with the board, there've been a few modifications to this, um, but in principle, the left side um, of the decision tree remains unchanged. Um, those are the hospitals we made decisions on last week, and that those were the uh, those were Gifford and Rutland who were able to submit a budget below the benchmark of 8.6% uh, net patient revenue growth from fiscal year 22 actuals to the fiscal year 24 budgets. Uh, we've determined that those assumptions were reasonable and approved them as submitted. Um, and now we're moving our attention to the other side of this decision tree. And so if if and when these hospitals have come in above be benchmark, um, you know, submitting budgets in good faith from that they uh, determine they need, we will consider modifying them by evaluating and weighing uh, the reasonableness of the budget assumptions, um, how each of the expense factors in the guidance compares with reference ranges, how expense growth compares with peers, 
um, how the, the um, request, particularly for rates, compares with the Medicare market basket and wage growth. Um, might want to consider some other inflationary indicators there. Uh, the factors and criteria set in the guidance and the factors, criteria and principles set out in statute, which we just reviewed. So again, we're moving to this side of the decision tree. Um, we have some kind of generic language if and if we get to any votes today that I can uh, pull back up. Uh, but any questions about the modifications to the decision tree or the way we're going to um, kind of start tackling these deliberations? Okay. All right. So first up, I'm going to pull up a template. Oh man, sharing this apart. Okay. Um so are you able to see my screen? Okay, great. Um, so what we have put together are some templates that essentially uh, are designed to summarize the record uh, to date. And so uh, this is for Southwestern Vermont Medical Center. Um, the top box uh, looks at budgetary growth over time. So you can see for each uh, fiscal year what the guidance was uh, for NPR what was submitted, and then this delta from the approved. So how much did the board's decision change what was submitted? So in the case of Southwest, you can see um, that longitudinally there haven't been uh, modifications to the NPR in this time period. Um, and you can see uh, the submitted and approved uh, commercial NPR. Um, and finally, operating expenses. So how those have changed over time. Um, and the last little bit, is the change in charge. Um, so as a reminder, uh, the board historically has only approved um, changes in charge, which is the charge master. Um, and so that's kind of the guiding star we have in looking at things uh, longitudinally. Um, and you can see what was submitted, um, if there was any changes from what was submitted. And then this last piece is the commercial weight of the improved uh, increase. So um, that's looking at of what was approved in rate, looking at the prior year's share of gross patient revenue among commercial. So of that 2.9%, we looked at the fiscal year 17 uh, gross payer revenue share of commercial to kind of weight that growth. And so you can see uh, over time, uh, pretty low uh, weight of that improved increase among commercial for Southwest um, with some jumps uh, in the recent year, um, looking at 3.1% growth um, was approved last year. And if approved as submitted an additional, um, the overall growth would be 2.0 um, from 22 to 24. Um, so a little bit of a re uh, reduction in the reliance on that rate. Um, the next part of the template is looking at the actuals. So um, budgets are, you know, a, a good guess, um, but never perfect. And so you can see that um, what the NPR has done uh, over time for both in total and just the commercial portion of that NPR, as well as the change in operating expenses over time. Um, and then we have here uh, in the corner, the gross patient revenue mix. So that's, uh, remember, if everyone comes in and is charged the same amount, uh, this is the share of that gross revenue that each payer would have. Um, in Southwest's case, uh, the traditional Medicare and Medicare Advantage are grouped. So back to the data model improvements we have in store um, and see that um, that that commercial payer mix for Southwest uh, in 22 was 32 percent of their gross patient revenue. Uh, in looking through their expense factors, um, we can see that for labor, the growth from fiscal year 22 to 24 in per FTE compensation was 6.8 percent, which was uh, the fourth lowest among Vermont hospitals. Uh, the median among Vermont hospitals was 4 percent. Um, and we see the benchmark of 5.2% uh, over time with a range of 0.8% to 9.7%. Uh, 
um, utilization growth um, at 1.6%, which was the 12th uh, near the bottom of Vermont hospitals, the median at 7%, with a range of negative 5.5 to 4.2%, so within benchmark for both of those indicators. Uh, the pharmaceutical expenses are not broken out in the data reported to us today, um, but in the testimony given as part of the budget hearings, um, we found that uh, that uh, Southwest's uh, information came right from their group purchasing organization and was within the range of 2.3 to 21.6 percent, and cost inflation of 5 percent was uh, toward the top, uh, or I'm sorry, Low, lower is better, so among the lowest in the state at three, um, with the benchmark being 5.8%, so right around that kind of uh, historical growth indicator. Um, just uh, summarizing the financial position, so um, I think a lot of these results um, in recent years are, are pretty difficult. It's uh, The financial challenges have been uh, really uh, I. Toughest, I think, in fiscal year 22, we're seeing uh, definite recovery in 23. Um, but when we look at uh, the values submitted in the fiscal year 24 budget, uh, we see values that are very close to median um, in almost all cases. A reminder that um, when it comes to days cash on hand, a lot of that is held at the parent level for Southwest, so not the most meaningful indicator. So not, not going to lose any sleep over that um, 61 days. Um, and seeing kind of the long-term debt to capitalization ratio dropping um, and a uh, fairly stable age of plant over time, which is close to the Vermont median. Um, and then when we look at the ratio of administrative and general salaries to the clinical salaries from the cost report, um, Southwest had a result of 36%, which was 13th, so right near the bottom um, of Vermont hospitals. Um, the percentile rank among its comparator groups was in the 38th percentile, so uh, below the median, uh, with that interquartile range being 37% to 53%, so um, right uh, near that 25th percentile among the comparators. Um, when we look at the average cost per Medicare discharge, uh, they uh, really stand out here uh, at 8,451. 8, That's, uh, you know, the, the least... Uh, the lowest value that we have for that indicator, um, and among their peer group, they um, also uh, were in the first percentile, so among the uh, least costly uh, based on that indicator. Um, and then finally, uh, probably the, the hardest thing to wrap our minds around is the relative cost in price. Um, so we have uh, inpatient and outpatient indicators here. So the commercial cost per discharge comes from the burns data. So you can see that they um, are below the 25th percentile in uh, fiscal year 18 for that commercial cost per discharge, right at it again in 19, per, below it in 20, below it in 21, and far below it in 22. Seeing um, cost that stable over time is notable. Um, that indicates uh, to me, um, because it is uh, consistent for both inpatient and outpatient, and over time, that that is uh, evidence that there's probably a lot of attention being paid to um, cost uh, management. Uh, and when we look at the cost coverage, um, again, that's saying so that's what Medicare says the allowable cost per discharge was. How much did they actually get paid? Um, so they're at 105% uh, in fiscal year uh, 18, so the 75th percentile, and pretty consistently staying right near there through fiscal year 20, um, staying relatively in the same place in fiscal year 21 and uh, showing a little bit more cost coverage in fiscal year 22. Um, again, because they are low cost, some of the cost coverage is a testament to uh, their management of those costs. Um, and then for the standardized price, um, that comes from the RAND information that we saw. And so that's saying, here's all the money they got from commercial payers, according to the All Payer Claims Database. Let's divide that by a standard unit of cost. And we see that um, they are within that interquartile range um, for the uh, inpatient. Uh, turning our attention to outpatient, we see very similar trends in the commercial cost per discharge, so right at that 25th percentile. Um, among the hospitals in Vermont, um, and then the commercial cost coverage being on the other end of the um, box plot at 75th percentile. 
um, and again, right within the interquartile range on standardized price. Um, so, uh, you know, the main reason that this hospital was over benchmark uh, had to do with $5 million worth of investments to increase access um, to care that they wanted to provide in their community. So, you know, the, the um, easiest way <laughs> to get this hospital to be within benchmark would be to, be, uh, to eliminate those enhancements. But uh, I think they, uh, in the evidence I saw demonstrated some real thoughtfulness about what they were expecting expanding and did it in a way that they knew that the cost um, that they would be um, providing to patients would be an improvement from where they're getting care today. Um, so uh, that is kind of what I wanted to present for you for this hospital. So interested in what other information would be helpful um, in deliberating on this hospital. Thank you, um, Director Lindbergh. I will, um, one procedural question, I think I got this right, but we'll do board member questions and comments. Uh, we'll have a potential vote. I'll read that. Then we'll take public comment. And then if there needs to be a vote, there'll be a vote. Does that sound correct? Is that right, Russ? <laughs> I can't hear you, Russ. Okay, sorry, is that better? Okay, yeah. I think what I just, what I heard was board member questions, comments, discussion, um, <clears throat> any, um, I guess if, going back to Dr. Merman's prior point, if there's a need for confidential executive session, um, and then a motion, public comment on the motion, and then a vote. I think that works, yeah. Great, okay, thanks for confirming. Um, okay, I'll open it up to board members for any comment or question they may have. Sarah, this is Tom, could you, um, bring back up the actual table. Yes, eventually. Bear with me. <laughs> Not such a boomer. All right. Uh, there you go. So could you help me understand the um, in operating expenses where it's uh, in fiscal year 18, it's 4.7% and uh, Seven point two million dollars. Is that the change from prior year? The percentages are changes from the prior year. Uh, the dollars are amounts certain, so those were the operating okay. expenses. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I was having trouble thinking of seven point two million dollars added. Um, yeah. Yeah. Fair. <laughs> okay. Thank you for clarifying. Um, no problem. That's it. Thanks. Can, can I just pull one more clarification on that? So that's confusing to me because if it goes from say 19, which is $7.2 million and then 20, oh, yeah. it goes you're, up you're by 1.5%. Right. Yeah. No, yeah. They're the amount change. I'm sorry. I misspoke. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, it is the amount of change. Sorry. <laughs> Um, Sarah, could could you remind me? I think I remember, but the um, investment and in access improvement. Can you describe that a little bit more for me again? Yeah, sure. Um, so investing in primary care uh, finally staffed up uh, since uh, the pandemic. Uh, so really trying to enhance the productivity among primary care providers, and then they're also looking to provide more cardiology and oncology services locally, and uh, really coming up with some. Um, neat ways of implementing um, some particularly oncology plans from uh, from uh, you know out of uh, out of state providers that are able to administrate those uh, administer those locally right okay thanks um, 
Um, I, I have nothing else. The only comment I would make is that, you know, a hospital that's containing costs and has high quality and is doing well, we want to see them making investments to do more of it. Um, so I, I, I don't have any um, concerns with the budget as proposed. Maybe others do, but um, I'm, I'm okay with this one. Yeah, I'll just jump in and say, you know, Southwest has always been a very well-managed hospital and uh, really good stewards of Vermont's resources, evidenced, I would say, by their complete avoidance of traveler's costs. They figured out a way to avoid traveler's costs in an era when most other hospitals couldn't do that. Um, their cost per adjusted discharge are really low. Their employee costs have kept pace with the ECI growth. Um, Five-star hospital leapfrog a rating you know quality is really high and they're managed to do that with low costs so for me um this is a hospital that i think you know the budget was reasonable the assumptions seemed reasonable to me and um, we should applaud them for their cost containment efforts and the, the culture they've built there that allows them to retain employees and not rely on travelers so i would support uh, approving this budget I agree with everything you just said, Jess, and I, I just want to throw out a few things that I, I want to highlight that I, I do think we just sort of need to keep an eye on. Um, on the Medicare cost report, they do have high admin costs, as Sarah mentioned, but they have this amazing to ability to balance that with a low adjusted cost per discharge. So I think that, you know, it's something for us just to keep an eye on over time and, and make sure that relationship is maintained. Uh, the other thing I, I, I would like to point out is the, the recent partnership with Dartman Hitchcock um, may have increased costs over time. And I think as a care board, we should keep an eye on, on what the cost of consolidation is to, to the providers, uh, to, to, to Vermont and uh, to that region. But I also am hopeful that the way they're doing it is actually going to lead to increased access and increased services for the community in southwestern Vermont. Um, and, and so just things to think about, things I'd like to keep an eye on in the future. But overall, uh, you know, this budget is just over, you know, the, the, the recommended benchmark, the cost uh, operating expenses um, managed to be contained. It's not asking for us a, a large rate increase, um, especially given the climate we're in. So I, I, I support it. Similarly, um, I think it's a uh, an organization to be applauded for the effort. Um, but as with um, Dave's comment, that the admin to clinical ratio um, is not where we'd like to see it. But I I wonder if they could help us unpack that number a bit further if we could ask in um our order to uh clarify that measure how they calculate it what goes into that measure um every organization has some discretion in what they put in line five in the cost report so helping us understand that um i think it's a type of organization to learn from so I support it um, otherwise without one request. I support the budget as well and don't have anything further to add. Great. Although I'm happy to um, make the motion if that would be helpful. I, if, yeah, if you'd like to, I think it sounds like there's consensus <clears throat> and um, I, I will just point out, I, I recall the testimony being pretty specific as to the cost savings efforts that the uh, affiliation was intended to drive. And, um, you know, that is something to make sure and follow through on and, and to hold accountable. But I think the intent was there and they actually sound like they had a pretty good plan. Uh, They're speaking about some of the redundancy they're going to make more efficient um, through the uh, affiliation. So, I'm looking forward to seeing that come to fruition and uh, it sounded like they had a good plan on that. Um, so yeah, uh, member lunch, if you wanna make the motion, I think that'd be great. Great, so um, before I do that, Sarah, I just wanna make sure I have my numbers that I have in front of me correct. I think the MPR over the two year period is 8.96%. Would you 
prefer I round that up or are we good with 8.96? 8.96 is fine. <laughs> okay. And uh, Rob, the, Robin, before you get into the yes. specifics of this, I just want to address Tom had mentioned wanting to have as part of the budget order um, uh, sort of an accountability of the admin to clinical ratio. I guess I just want to confirm, Tom, would you be okay if that was outside of the budget order? Do you feel that that should be part of the budget order and part of this motion? Um, <clears throat> I defer to uh, our council and chair. I'm not, I don't have a specific um, request for where it is. I think it would help us. So whatever is most appropriate. I'll give my quick reaction if you go ahead. Well, I was going to say I, the board could take either approach. I um, um, hospitals are generally pretty responsive to our requests to help understand and unpack um, data and cost reports. So I don't think. Um, You know, it. Um, let me give you two responses. Um, one is that you know we we can and do ask for information from hospitals without having it as a specific um, called out as a specific condition, but we do have in the standard conditions that the board is considering a requirement that the hospital shall file all requested data and other information in a timely and accurate manner. Um, and then separate from that, the board does have authority under statute to collect information from hospitals. Um, so I think I'm inclined to say that we could accomplish that um, goal and get that information from the hospital without specifying um, that particular piece of it in the budget order uh, conditions. But having said that, um, I could defer to the board if um, you thought it was important and wanted to call it out specifically as a, a particular condition. I'll just give my view as one board member, which is this hospital has done really well at containment. So even if those admin numbers are not where we want i know i i you know there's some judgment here and i feel the culture is very collaborative with southwest and that they'll give us what we need and they're going to shoot us straight like i just have that feeling that we don't need it here would be my reaction i guess i just trust that we'll get what we need yeah and they've already kind of helped us understand it from their perspective and right. i think the work is kind of trying to um, integrate that learning across the different facilities That all sounds good to me. OK, so um, and Sarah, the change in charge that I had noted was 9.5%. Is that am I correct? So the charge will be from 23 to 24. So that is 6.6. .6. Oh, thank you. OK, here we go. I move that we approve Southwestern Medical Center's budget as submitted with a 8.96% increase from fiscal year 22 actuals to fiscal year 24 budgeted NPR FPP, a 6.6% change, excuse me, charge increase from fiscal year 23 to 24, uh, and that the budget be subject to the standard budget conditions. Uh, that we will approve next week. I'll second. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Sir. aye. Um, aye. Thanks. Did you want to take public oh. comment? Yes. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I wrote it down too. I apologize. Um, all right. Well, thank you for the motion in the second, and I'll, I'll first turn to the healthcare advocate and then to public comment. 
Uh, thanks, Chair Foster. Uh, nothing from us on this. And just to member Walsh's comment, the admin to clinical ratio, I think it could be something we think about with the guidance, maybe formalizing that more in FY25. But yeah, we support, as we said in our recommendations, we support it. Thank you. Okay, and any public comment via the raise your hand function? Uh, Mr. D, and just for the record, um, I believe you're the CEO of Southwest. Please go ahead. That's right. Thank you, um, Chair. And I just wanted to thank the board for their support. And uh, please know we will respond quickly to any requests on any further breakdown information necessary on administrative cost. And um, for um, Dave, uh, your comments on the uh, uh, on the integration with Dartmouth Hitchcock, certainly um, well taken, but our, clearly our strategy and vision is to help to make ourselves, our operations more cost effective under that integration strategy. So we, we welcome a further review um, next year. Thank you. Great, thank you for your comments. Any other public comments? Okay, um, and we had a second, so all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And the motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much, um, and I think we can move on. All right. Um, moment while we shift gears. Um, so next we'll be discussing Northwestern. <clears throat> Okay, so same template. Uh, sorry, I just had the clash in my head for a second. Um, so here we have Northwestern Medical Center. So uh, you can see that over time, the board has made adjustments to Northwest's uh, submitted budget. Um, so there was a minus 1.3% uh, adjustment in fiscal year 18 and a minus 4% uh, adjustment downward in fiscal year 21. Uh, of note, that budget already came in as a negative and the board further uh, further uh, adjusted that downward. Um, also of note, uh, they were one of the only hospitals that uh, submitted a budget within benchmark last year. Um, but if we look at the two-year growth rate at 10.3%, they are a smidge above uh, the guidance of 8.6. Um, looking at their commercial NPR over time, um, the board actually uh, made an, an upward adjustment in 18 that had to do with some uh, late breaking information in the budget process that year. Um, but there was a downward adjustment again in fiscal year 21 uh, of negative 7.7% uh, in the approved budget. So that's where some of that adjustment came from. Um, and then some adjustment after the board's decision uh, related to uh, they took it upon themselves when the final uh, Medicare rule was higher than the proposed uh, to give themselves a bit of a haircut to account for that. Um, so operating expenses were adjusted a little bit upward um, in fiscal year 20. Um, if memory serves, that was uh, mostly COVID related um, and giving kind of more room for some of the unexpected uh, expenses that uh, hospitals were facing that year. Um, and then looking at the um, rate increases um, that were submitted over time, you can see again in the years where the NPR was adjusted, uh, those rates were adjusted downward uh, to the tune of negative two and a half percent in fiscal year 18 and a negative 8.1 percent uh, adjustment in fiscal year 21. Um, you can see that uh, the commercial weight um, of the increases um, was a little bit higher in fiscal year 21, but generally was, um, you know, within the range of about 2 to 4%. Um, if approved as submitted, um, that change in charge would be um, 6.0 for the two years, um, so a little bit backloaded um, for the two years. Um, but only about half of that is kind of uh, being reliant on the commercial uh, payer mix. Um, looking at their actuals over time, again, uh, so these are 
got that clear changes in rates and amount of money. So seeing that there. Um, operating expense growth um, had been a, a north of 5% up until 2020, but has been below, um, you know, close three or almost or near that or under um, since. So pretty impressive uh, management of the operating expenses. Um, also, you know, seeing a lot of volatility um, in the pandemic um, and seeing that recovery starting to kick in in fiscal year 23. Um, have a relatively higher proportion uh, of commercial uh, payers in their gross uh, payer mix. And again, uh, the one that's, that's tricky here is that Medicare Advantage actually is in this bucket for them. So that number is a bit deceptive and it likely is inflating some of these estimates a bit. So um, just uh, note that. Um, so the labor expenses, uh, they were among the, uh, you know, most impressive in terms of, uh, you know, decrease in the per FT compensation. Some of that has to do with um, the restructuring they're doing, um, but uh, certainly within uh, benchmark and below the median among Vermont hospitals. Um, some modest uh, changes to utilization um, related to places that they're trying to uh, address access issues um, and uh, again don't break out the pharmacy uh, pharmaceutical expenditures in the adaptive information but testimony showed that they were comfortably within that range um, and that was uh, based upon the group purchasing uh, Values that they have um, and cost inflation, again, very close to uh, Southwest. So seeing that 5%, um, which is uh, very in line with historical values, uh, if a bit above the Vermont median for this year. Um, so yeah, looking for some recovery, um, but seeing that uh, most of these values, again, are very close to um, the Vermont uh, medians. Uh, days cash on hand uh, are a bit higher um, than the median. Uh, I think that that uh, as hospitals contend with the volatility in their revenue um, nationally, we're seeing um, kind of a more interest in trying to retain that cash and uh, kind of protect the ability to borrow when needed, especially for deferred improvements. Um, debt service coverage ratio um, below the median, but um, not necessarily um, a lot more volatility in this just due to kind of market conditions um, and long term to debt capitalization ratio very close to the state median and uh, the age of plant uh, looking pretty consistent over this time period. Uh, they were near the bottom of the at 27 percent of that ratio um, to, of uh, admin in general to clinical um, among their comparators. They were in the 33, 33rd percentile, which is below the 25th percentile. So, um, you know, relatively lower, uh, in, you know, uh, more investment in clinical information. Uh, clinical salaries, uh, and then the CMI per adjusted discharge. This is one that um, uh, Stephanie Bro and I have been kind of uh, noodling about um, what might be going on here, but uh, just trying to learn more about that indicator as it uh, is manifesting at Northwest, but uh, near the uh, number nine, so um, getting towards a little bit above the midpoint um, among Vermont hospitals and among their comparators at the 96th percentile, so pretty close to that 75th percentile, or I'm sorry, uh, a little bit north, uh, a little bit higher than the 75th percentile among their comparators. Uh, and then when we look at uh, the um, commercial cost per discharge, we see that they um, over time um, are kind of relatively uh, stable near the 75th percentile in cost, but also see this cost coverage. So um, they are not uh, getting the costs covered, the Medicare allowable costs covered by the commercial rate. Um, some of that um, in recent years has um, you know, improved a little bit, but um, seeing that at 76% is um, not necessarily common uh, for commercial cost coverage. Um, and looking at their standardized price, uh, they were below the 25th percentile uh, on inpatient. On the outpatient side, uh, we see a stable trend, but here they're um, towards the 25th percentile over time, um, with the cost coverage being uh, more favorable, um, but declining uh, in, uh, com you know, getting back to around that 200% of the cost. So the Medicare allowable cost being at the 25th percentile, they're able to cover about 200% of that cost. Um, and seeing here, they're right within the interquartile range on the standardized price. So to me, that's showing kind of um, relatively low uh, commercial reimbursement uh, compared to peers, um, which you know 
put putting their uh, commercial request into context, which was I want to make sure I say this correctly. Oh, where are you? Um, There you are at 6%. So of that 6% rate increase, expecting 4.5% uh, uh, from the commercial payers. So uh, so that, um, again, is kind of the summary. Um, you know, this one uh, seemed really clear. Uh, they've uh, demonstrated a lot of uh, work to improve the quality and uh, seem to be tackling that head on. Uh, just ref uh Receive some late breaking news that they will, in fact, participate in all three ACO programs, which um, I think is a, a really big deal to the communities operating up in that area. So um, just a shout out for uh, for that from staff or from how I see it anyway. So that was uh, what I wanted to present today um, uh, related to this submission. Any questions, uh, comments, concerns that would help the board in this uh, decision? Sarah, could you keep that document up and actually uh, pan back up again? I just have a, one question for you. Um, uh, let's see. So uh, on commercial NPR submitted and changed and approved, I just want to understand I get this feel correctly. So say at FY21 where the submitted was 11.4%. And the change to prove is negative 7.7%. So the is board that... adjusted that 11.4 down by 7.7 7 percentage points. Okay, so it's still a positive. It wasn't they were given a negative rate, but, but the board adjusted the 11.4 down by 7.7. 7, so it's still a. Okay. Yeah. This is my, my one question on this. I, I, I guess I'll just start otherwise. Um, so I think Northwest is coming in very slightly above the NPR FPP. Um, target, um, uh, and I think largely uh, driven by um, some increases in utilization uh, that I think is probably appropriate for the region. Um, I'm very supportive of their budget. I mean, I think the admin to clinical ratio that gets flagged out on the cost report is something to think about. And again, I think similar to what Tom suggested for Southwestern that we could speak with um, Northwest to discuss it, but I also think that that's balanced by low inpatient prices and prior low increases. So in spite of having this one, this one data point just seems aberrant from the rest of the trend. So um, I, I'm, I'm supportive of this, this approving this budget in full. Um. Same, I have the same um, response as to as I did with Southwest. I'd like to understand that ratio better at this facility. Um, and if you could scroll down a little bit, uh, please, to the uh, cost per discharge table. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to understand this uh, a little better too at this facility. There's, um, it. It doesn't make sense with the rest of the information and data points that we have. Um, I think it's a strong, uh, strong submission, good trends, um, but I'd like more information from them to help understand um, that number. Yeah, I, I don't want to speak for um, Stephanie, but uh, she's also very eager to get to the bottom of it. So. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah, happy to work with them to try to figure that out because it's um, yeah, my my suspicion is there's just something, um, yeah, it'll be good to learn more with them. I don't have anything to add. Um, I did have one question to make sure that I caught it correctly, Sarah, if you go up a little bit on this. I think you were saying that for Northwest that the Medicare Advantage is reported in the commercial, right? So even though the chart on the right 
says there's zero Medicare Advantage, that's because it's reported in commercial. Am I getting that correctly? That's correct. Yeah, and they're uh, in the process of starting to break that out in their own systems. I think everyone knows that that's uh, an important uh, revenue stream to isolate. So um... Great. Yeah. Understood. Okay, thank you. I don't have anything to add. I support the budget um, with member Walsh. I'm very interested in understanding more about the cost per adjusted discharge and why it's so high, but I suspect we'll we'll learn more as this goes on. And um, hopefully we'll either figure out if there's an anomaly in the data or uh, I suspect given the, you know, the efforts underway at Northwestern around productivity and around cost containment already happening, that that number will come down. So I support the budget as it was submitted. I also support the budget. I'm happy to make a motion if we're ready for that. Uh, I think we are. Okay. And before I do that, I, I was remiss in, in saying I did want to commend Northwestern on their equity efforts. They've been a real leader in that area. And we have uh, some of their folks from quality and equity participating in the global budget tag, and they've been very helpful in thinking about that, those aspects. Um, so I'll move that we approve Northwestern Medical Center's budget. And Sarah, if you could move to the motion language, please. Just so I get it right. I, I can try I to do it. Try to do it. I'm seeing yeah. standard budget conditions. Okay. Ah, great. Mm -hmm. I got it. Thank you. Uh, move to approve Northwestern's budget as submitted with a 10.32% uh, increase from fiscal year 22 actual to fiscal year 24 budgeted NPR FPP, taking into account uh, the provider transfer included in their budget uh, with an increase um, of 6% in charges from fiscal year 23 to 24 and subject to the standard budget conditions. Please correct me if I messed that up, but. I believe that's correct. Um, just, you know, for the record, um, that is accounting for the provider transfer. So um, yes. that is kind we of the, yeah. <laughs> we typically do need to approve the, provide or have approved the provider transfer impact on the NPR, which is why I included that in there. Thank you, yeah. Yep. All right, that's my motion. All right, I will second it, and then I will turn to the healthcare advocate. Sorry, it took me a second. Nothing from us. We support it. Thank you. And uh, is there any public comment? Uh, Ms. Rialt? Hi, I just want to thank you guys um, for supporting Northwestern, and I want to turn it over to Peter Wright as well, because I know he wanted to say a few words, but really appreciate the collaboration with Sarah and her team, and very, very happy um, to continue working with you on the admin ratio and the cost per discharge ratio, because I agree there's something going on there, and I really, really, really want to know what it is, so <laughs> we will absolutely get to the bottom of that. Great, thank you. Um, and. Uh, just for the record, I believe uh, you're both associated with the hospital, um, but uh, Mr. Wright, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair Foster. Yes, yeah, Stephanie's our Chief Financial Officer. Um, I definitely want to thank the spirit of cooperation. Um, we, we're very, very willing to come to the table to better understand those numbers. Um, as you recognize, and we appreciate very diligent about keeping our costs under control while moving forward hospital quality and safety and making sure we do that in a an environment that supports uh, equity and equality. So really appreciate you taking the time to mention those things we're working really hard on and appreciate our partnership with the board and you tell us when you can meet and we'll be there. So thank you. Great, thanks. Um, 
I don't see any other public comment. Um, I, I think Mr. Wright's point is right. I mean, when you can do what they're doing in an economic and efficient way, it's a benefit for our system. And so I think that's why it looks like we have unanimous support and we'll take our vote. Um, all board members in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Um, motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Um, Director Lindbergh, I, I, I want to take just um, a three minute break if we can, um, and then we'll just come back and proceed. So we'll come back, uh, we'll make it five. We'll come back at 11 a.m. Okay, it looks like everyone's here, so we can uh, resume. I'll turn it back to Director Lindbergh. Okay, um, so the next uh, hospital that we will look at is Brattleboro Memorial Hospital. All right, hopefully that's coming through for you. Um, so uh, a few important uh, differences about Brattleboro Memorial Hospital is um, they have some uh, Medicare designations as a Medicare dependent and low volume hospital that um, uh, affects the reimbursements they get through Medicare. So um, that that is kind of uh, the main driver of the NPR uh, that we, we've seen in the submitted budget. So uh, we do see that um, over time, uh, and uh, I apologize, I didn't uh, flag these, but um, over time we have seen some downward adjustments uh, to the submitted NPR for Brattleboro. So took uh, 1.7 uh, off of the 5% that was submitted in fiscal year 18, took a percent and a half off in 19. 2.2 percent off in 20 um, and in 22 there was a downward adjustment of 2.7 percent so quite a quite a few adjustments um, but were approved at the 13.3 percent last year for the two-year total of 19.9 so a lot of the two-year growth is uh, front-loaded in the the current uh, fiscal year um, seeing a lot of change uh, in the commercial NPR over time so again uh, some of those adjustments uh, trickled down to the commercial NPR over time, um, seeing, you know, substantial growth in 23. Um, I'd like to point out that that is um, largely driven by utilization. Um, so they were hit pretty hard uh, with the Omicron variant in fiscal year 22 and had um, especially low utilization rates. So um, I just don't want anyone to see that as a pure price uh, because it's largely driven by utilization. Um, operating expense growth, so again, some downward adjustments over time, um, but aside from um, fiscal year uh, 20 and 23, below 5% um, uh, in the submissions. Um, and then looking at that change in charge, uh, there were some downward adjustments, um, but again, given the uh, mix of the commercial payer uh, in the gross revenue, we see that uh, by and large, uh, the contribution uh, that that's making to their um, bottom line is, is pretty minimal, uh, with 23 being an exception at the 5.2%. Um, but uh, the ask for the current fiscal year would be a 1.5% uh, change in charge, which is uh, about half a percent uh, when you weight that by the commercial payer mix. So um, just a lot of that uh, approval was ha happened last year. Um, you can see over time that uh, we uh, the operating results here, um, you know, are pretty spotty. A lot of volatility. Uh, that's mostly because of the small numbers. Um, but seeing that the operating expense growth um, has been uh, pretty well managed, uh, fiscal year 20 being the exception due to some COVID-related stuff, and uh, obviously the inflationary growth that we've seen in recent years, uh, working on getting uh, kind of the most up-to-date information uh, for them. So I uh, don't have that uh, populated for you today. Um, and uh, the commercial uh, case mix, so again, uh, not seeing that breakout for MA, so that's uh, appearing in the Medicare, a traditional Medicare bucket uh, for now, um, and that commercial uh, gross contribution to the revenue is at 36%. Uh, for expense growth factors, so the labor uh, per comp per FTE compensation growth was at 10%, uh, so the third uh, ranked hospital in Vermont, uh, you know, uh, just above the benchmark. So seeing that uh, they're kind of trying to invest in more resources locally, we heard in their testimony, and uh, move away from travelers and bring some of that cost in in house. Uh, utilization again. So this is a testament to 
uh, how low the utilization was relatively in 22. So just a huge increase in utilization, uh, just again, mostly uh, due to the Omicron variant and some other disruptions in fiscal year 22. Um, another crazy outcome for the pharmaceutical expense. So that's, uh, uh, you know, usually you have a patient that had a very high uh, cost pharmaceutical that moved on. So um, just a very volatile number in this case. And uh, the cost inflation at 6% is uh, right near that benchmark um, and number two uh, ranked among Vermont hospitals. Uh, the operating margin submitted is very modest at 0.7%, so definitely not trying to uh, grow too fast um, from or to too high a margin. Uh, still trying to recover in terms of their cash position. Um, total margin also uh, quite far below uh, what we're seeing in the Vermont median. Um, and uh, that age of plant uh, is, is pretty high compared to other Vermont hospitals at 25 years. So know that there's probably some additional capital improvements uh, that are going to be happening. Um, and so for the admin uh, ratio of administrative and general salaries to clinical salaries, uh, they were the third lowest at 16.8%, uh, right at the median uh, compared to their comparator groups. Um, or the 54th percentile, um, which uh, the way the the the, the data is very skewed, so that uh, is also the 75th percentile. Um, and then the cost per discharge is also quite low at 9,928. So um, seeing they happen to be right at that same relative position um, and near the 25th percentile in that distribution. Um, and then finally, uh, so when we look at the cost uh, per commercial cost per discharge uh, from the Burns data, uh, we see that they were right within the interquartile range uh, in uh, fiscal year 18, but only had 97% of those costs covered. Um, their cost was relatively lower in fiscal year 19, below the 25th percentile, so that drove better cost coverage. Um, that trend has uh, kind of continued since and seeing an improvement on the cost coverage, but not seeing an, an improvement in cost. So um, one reason you would see that trend is um, cost management improving. Um, and then uh, see a very almost identical pattern um, on the outpatient side, though in recent years, um, seeing that creep up a little bit. I think that's more as care shifts from the inpatient to outpatient setting. and. Um, seeing that their cost coverage is relatively high for commercial payers um, uh, for outpatient procedures, but and their standardized prices within the interquartile range. So um, yeah, I, I think um, you know this one's a little bit funky in that the NPR growth is is the highest that we saw, but the commercial rate increase is the lowest. So kind of an odd. Uh, mix to see. I don't think we've seen that pattern every day. So I think there's a, a, maybe a lot of questions here. So I want to understand what will help you make your decision on this, uh, this particular submission. Um, I, I have one quick one, um, Sarah, before we turn to the other board members. But if you go to the age of plant one, there's just a number that jumped out at me. So in 22 actual it was 15.7, but then it jumped up to 16, and then 23 year to date, 26. And then 24 submitted 25. I just didn't quite understand how those ages can fluctuate so drastically. Yeah, let's uh, look into that because, uh, yeah, that jumped out at me too, and I didn't get a chance to go back to the record on that one. So uh, I can uh, take that as homework. Okay. I'll turn to the other board members. So, Sarah, on the utilization and the NPR growth, so when I look at the profit and loss statement that was in this submission, it looks to me like from at least at that time, um, 23 budget was 
105, 484, 860. The projection at that point was 106, 227, 721. And then the submission was for 111, 164, 182. And that the fiscal year 23 to 24 budget to budget was 5.4%. So it seems like the, the growth from 23 to 24, it would be a little bit less than that from projected to budget. Exactly. Yeah. Um, just that just helped. I just thought I'd say that out loud because that helped me kind of follow the 22 actuals, which are skewed because of the COVID issues that they had with their staffing early in 22. Um, so that's all. I just wanted to make sure I was, I wanted to say that out loud and just make sure that was still seemed accurate. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's a really good way to kind of frame it. <laughs> like, yeah, this one really is a little bit um, not like the others in a lot of ways. Hey, hey Russ, um, I have some questions uh, for you regarding this budget that I think um, relate to uh, matters that are, are confidential and I'm trying to figure out if there's a way we, we could speak about them um, in an executive session. So um, I was interested in, in, in at some point in here making a motion to, to enter executive session to, to discuss this. If, if that should be now, Owen, uh, or if it should be after further deliberation, I'm not sure. Um, let's take finished board member questions and comments. Um, and actually, let's finish public comment as well. And I think then maybe do executive session if that's okay with you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, do you have anything else aside from the legal advice, Dave? Uh, I'm, I'm going to hold off for now. Yeah. Okay. Any other homework for the team here? Um, okay. So I, I think uh, the board looks set unless Chair Foster, you have anything for us? No. Um, why don't we put up the motion? I don't think we're going to vote on this one today, but we might as well put up the motion and just see the language and then we can take public comment. Okay. Um, Actually, you know what? I'm sorry. I should wait until we actually have what the motion is before I take public comment. So why don't we turn to um, the potential executive session? And I think we need two motions to do that. So I'll I'll move first. Um, I move we find that premature general public knowledge regarding the legal advice of counsel at the board regarding the board's consideration of Brattleboro's budget would clearly place the board at a substantial disadvantage in any appeal or other challenge that may arise out of the board's decisions. Second. Um, all those in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Um, the first motion carries. The second motion uh, is um, that I move that we enter into executive session to consider confidential attorney-client communications regarding the board's consideration of Brattleboro's uh, budget under the provisions of Title I, Section 313A1F of the Vermont Statutes. Attendance at the executive session will be the board members and the board's legal team, executive director, and staff working on hospital budgets. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Um, and the vote carries unanimously. Um, Ms. Lajas, do we have an executive session set up already? We just, just emailed it to you. Great. <laughs> great, great, thank you. 
Okay, um, we'll adjourn this and the board will go into executive session and I don't know how long it'll take, but 15 minutes perhaps. Um, okay, thanks. We'll adjourn and go to executive session. Okay, uh, we'll reconvene our hearing, um, but it will be brief because we're going to, um, I'm going to move to seek to adjourn because of a meeting I have to get to and I think Robin has to get to. So um, we will take up Brattleboro and the other hospitals um, on Friday. And so is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 We're adjourned and um, we'll see you on Friday. Thank you.